we are uh, in, in the studio in Sydney. We have uh, uh, Michael Stevenson, Chief Sales Officer at uh, Nine, of course. We have Pat Darcy, who is Chief Data and Technology Officer at Dentsu Aegis Network. And then our international panellists, which is going to be fascinating. We have Laura Nelson, Senior Vice President for Cross Portfolio Solutions at Disney Advertising Sales. And we know the, the frenetic uh, activity that Disney's been in in the last uh, last 12 months and, and the, the stellar launch again of, of Disney+. Plus. So we're going to have a fascinating, a fascinating conversation there. And Tim Sims, who's the Chief Revenue Officer for the trade desk and Tim has a has a global view on uh, what's happening in television both linear streaming you name it so we will I think we'll, we'll go to Laura uh, Nelson first um Laura what the hell is happening in the US and I'm not talking about <laughs> politics by the way we're talking about television it's been you know there's an enormous amount of frantic activity in the US with lots of streaming services lots of broadcasters uh, doing streaming ad supported um, give us a sense on what's happened with uh, with audiences and how they're behaving in the US in the last 12 months and welcome Laura Thanks for joining. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, I think we've seen a, a big shift in the last few years to more um, streaming services and, you know, connected TV or, you know, um, cutting the cord, as we say here in the States. Um, but I think things have been accelerated uh, in a post-COVID world. So we've seen, you know, usage of connected TV increase you know, year over year by over 30 percent. And a lot of that, I think, is, is driven based on, um, you know, the results of COVID. Um, but then in our traditional businesses like broadcast and cable, we've seen, we've seen a slight dip, but most of that is due to the fact we haven't had sports programming in the U.S. for the better part of, of the last probably five, uh, five of the six months. So we're just starting to see uh, that come back with the influx of sports. So there's a lot of like industry things that have already been taking place, but then I think some changes in consumption pattern that have just been um, you know, affected due to COVID like we all have been. The, the sports uh, you talk about, Laura, do you think when, when it comes back and comes back with, a, with, with, with vengeance that people will go back to the broadcast signal or, or, or cable as, as it happens in the US or will they start streaming more because they've got that habit uh, that's been entrenched? What's your sense there? Um, I think we um, are, are seeing... Um... I think one of the unique things that's happening right now, particularly in sports, is that we have a lot of leagues playing at the same time. So we're seeing an influx of impressions within our marketplace, and we're seeing increases in both linear and digital. So, um, you know, it, in fact, on ESPN this week, we just launched our first Monday Night Football NFL game, and it was up 30, over 30 percent versus last year. So people are still going to the uh, the. Uh, broadcast and cable, particularly for those live linear events. Um, but we're still seeing digital uses because there's surrounding content, even as it relates to short form or, or social activity during the games. So it's a little bit of both. And in terms of that, that uh, the streaming services and so forth, is it, is it being led like we've seen in other parts and here particularly? Is it, is it across demos? Is, what's the age groups that are driving that? Where are you seeing the, the, the particular spikes? Um, I think the increase in connected TV usage is still being driven mostly um, by the under 35. We saw about 65% of, of, of the U.S. marketplace um, being driven by that younger younger demographic. Okay, and so Tim uh, Tim Sims, uh, is that is that uh, what you're seeing internationally? Your take on the U.S. and what Laura's talking about? What's the big the big consumption changes here? Because you're obviously uh, hedging, your, putting your bets into 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 digital television, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, James covered a lot of this up, uh, up front. And, and just to build on some of the stuff that Laura was talking about in the U.S. market, and then I'll come back to, to international in a second. I, I think we've seen an acceleration, as everyone pointed out. I think we've kind of taken a four-year timeline, maybe, and compressed it into, into about <laughs> nine months as far as what's been happening from a consumption pattern perspective. And what's unique about this is it's being led by consumers, and consumers are making a lot of choices right now to say, well, you know, I want to consume content this way. I want to use these services. And some of the research we've done suggested, uh, similar to what Laura described, which is that um, you know when you look at uh, at least this year uh, and, and across all users, you've got about 11-ish percent of people saying that they're going to cut the cord by the end of the year here in the United States. And that's building on top of about 45 million TV households in the U.S. who've already done that. Um, and so I think we're seeing an acceleration because normally that number is about 3%. And then as Laura pointed out, in the 18 to 34 demographic, it, it's even higher. It's about 18% of people saying they're going to cut the cord by the end of the year. And 
so I think that's really indicative of just the trend that's happening in the United States. One of those, of course, just because of you know the the um, pandemic is is around cost. You know, we've had high unemployment numbers in the United States, and so some of those th factors that are external are helping to drive that acceleration. Um, and so it, it's definitely something that um, you know we're seeing across the board in the U.S. And it, what that creates is a is a really interesting opportunity for marketers, which I know we'll get into in a moment. We so will. when you zoom out and uh, internationally, you know, we're seeing a lot, a lot of the same thing. I, I think what's unique, uh, kind of, if you take a really truly macro view of this out, outside of even the U.S. And, and Australia, is that the consumption patterns are a lot different. Like in, in the U.S., what's kind of interesting is that we went on this kind of like. 40 year journey where we where we kind of like du li quite literally dug up the ground and like laid cable in the ground and connected all of this content to everyone's homes. But then when you look at markets kind of in, in your neighboring region in Southeast Asia, you know, a lot of those markets kind of skipped that step and they went straight to mobile consumption. They went straight to tablet consumption. They went straight to kind of other consumption patterns that were largely coming over a Wi-Fi uh, connected device. And I think that's really incredible because you have this distribution of premium content that's finding the users where they are on whatever device that is that they want to choose. And that's so that's certainly true in kind of the neighboring region for, for, for Australia. And then in Europe, they're, they're going through a similar life cycle as we are in the U.S., where you've got consumers coming into it to a more connected environment and, you know, partnering with the, or, or choosing a lot of the same content that they would choose from a Disney uh, or, or anyone else. And so I, I think it's really fascinating times right now. And uh, we're seeing this across the board everywhere, not just in the U.S., Laura, Tim talked about the the cord cutting in the U.S. Um, does it does it feel like uh, there's more pressure? You you must be feeling some pressure on the or the broadcast side, but must be feeling some pressure uh, on that cord cutting. And what does that mean uh, for your other services, your streaming services? And what has been the biggest surprise, I guess, for you uh, this year? Or is there something jumped out in terms of consumption that uh, you didn't see coming, or has has really accelerated? No, I, I mean, I think what's interesting is in recent months, we've seen traditional media um, see an increase in very traditional metrics like co-viewing, right, which is something that, um, you know, um, people are still tuning in for some of these live big events. But then when you think about the streaming services and the inclusion of Hulu as part of the overall Disney portfolio, you're starting to see, you know, a huge increases in binging. And we've even noticed that People are binging shows that have multiple seasons, shows like Grey's Anatomy, where you're seeing huge binging on Hulu for, that will only going to feed into the interest as it comes back to broadcast, right? So um, I, I wouldn't say there's anything that surprised us. I mean, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things in the world that are surprising us right now. I yes, think yes. at this point there's just an acceleration of moving people to uh, more of a, you know, dynamically ad inserted world. Um, but then still finding there's times where people are still using traditional media in a way that they have been in, in the past. Uh, we'll jump to uh, way, way, way down under and, and talk to, to, to Pat Darcy uh, about the top lines on, on, on Australia, Pat. What are, you, what are the numbers before we get into some of the deep and meaningful stuff around the industry implications? Um, behaviour here, consumption behaviour yep. here. I, I think very similar. I mean, I think go very macro overall consumption of tv is is up and i think you know absolutely covid's played a role in that but i think it's important to mention that you know we've never had access to as much great content to binge and choose to watch it our, our own way um, and so i think that's a great thing for, for the industry broadly speaking um, i think subscription on-demand services here are driving a lot of the growth. Uh, there was a piece in the AFI recently that, you know, I think we, as an industry, we, we were debating whether people would uh, need to choose or whether they'd be comfortable to have multiple. And, and clearly they're showing us that they're, they're okay to have multiple um, subscriptions, which is contributing to the growth. And then I think um, absolutely over COVID, on-demand broadcast um, has, has grown significantly, right, while we're all at home. I think similar to the US, and I'd say other markets, connected TVs, consumption through, you know, a connected TV at home is by far the, the biggest growth curve. I think we're over 50% now in Australia of, of broadcast on-demand viewing is, is on a connected TV device, which makes sense, right? We want to watch the shows we love on a big screen with our family. So I don't think that's a surprise um, to anyone. Michael Stevenson, nine, uh, and, and what you're seeing with your viewers across your portfolio, uh, what's, um, what are you seeing this, this year? Give us some numbers, Michael. Um, and con consumer behaviour is, is certainly changed and changing, and I think there's no doubt that COVID has accelerated um, the way in which we, consumers will consume content across multiple platforms and in, multi and in different ways. And, 
you know, very early on through the COVID experience, uh, one of my sons said, Dad, COVID will be good for TV viewing. Um, and got him programmed well, Michael. And he was right. Um, <laughs> you know, our live linear audiences have grown, um, in particular, and news product, the audiences consuming our news has increased by, you know, sort of double digits um, against those sort of those key demographics. But of course, so has on-demand viewing through our BVOD service. We're fortunate enough um, at nine to also have an SVOD service and Stan. We've seen the consumption of, of Stan increase as well. The thing that is interesting to me is within the on-demand environment, it's the consumption of our content via the live stream, which is probably something that has surprised me a little. Uh, we're really seeing an acceleration of, of, um, of live streaming. And, you know, at times that can be up to 20% of our on-demand um, or, or our BVOD audiences, which I think is quite interesting. It is. And, and does that, how does that sit, Laura, with what you're seeing in the US? Is, that sim is there any similarities there or is it a bit different? Uh, it, just to clarify, you're saying you're seeing more of live viewing within a streaming environment versus, yeah. you know, traditional. Uh, yeah, I think um, particularly... Uh, um, for ESPN, we have our own app, and there's a lot of live viewing that happens there. So that's been a little bit tricky um, in the past because the sports is obviously hasn't been around. But we see a ton of, of viewership that happens there um, when sports are on, and and that's increased as as we've been back in the marketplace. And I think the other point you made, news is up a lot. News is a is a very live. Um, um, uh, a, a live content. So we see particularly on our um, ABC News Live app, as well as our, we have a lot of local affiliates across the country that we're, we're seeing increased um, live streaming there as well. What, Laura, just um, just before we get onto the, into some some down in, in what's going on with brands and agencies, uh, what is the uh, the proportion of uh, of your audience and viewing that is sitting is coming through streaming and, and digital channels versus the broadcast? Where is that? Have you got a sense on that now? Have you got a number you can you can you can pull? Um, I would say we we do see some variation um, as it relates to sort of the portfolio that we have, right? So you think about um, uh, a broadcast network which is more live driven, and in sports which is more live driven versus um, you know some of the the cable companies. So I, I just think the number varies a lot. I think where we're seeing you know a lot of the shifting is uh, you know on the devices in which they're uh, viewing those, and and over fifty percent across the board across our portfolio is happening you know on a on a connected TV now, and that's really where we're seeing sort of the shift in behavior, sort of live versus streaming. It just it, it varies so much across our portfolio. Okay, so let's get to let's get to what's happening um, in, in the U.S. right now with how brands and agency groups are are uh, responding to these to these shifts. Laura, um, what are the what are the conversations you're having now with brands and agencies? How are they responding to this? What are they looking for? What are they preparing for? And what do they want from Disney uh, is that in, in terms of how they plan and trade? I think you, you talked, we talked earlier about how there's quite a, at the big end of town, quite a lot of clients are uh, looking to in-house at least some of that, that capability in, when it comes to television. Yeah, I, I think there's, a, I think, two big trends. Um, the ability, I think, that uh, the, the industry was moving to wanting to have more flexibility in terms of how you move in inventory across platforms and across these larger portfolios that have been created in, in the U.S. And I think COVID is only making the need for flexibility even, even more important because as, as agencies um, and brands are planning for the new year, obviously there's impacts on different categories in different ways, and they need to make sure that they understand that they have the flexible terms uh, in place to make that happen. But it's also just flexibility. If I've, I've committed a certain amount of money to you, I want to make sure that it gets delivered. And if it gets delivered linearly or digitally, or potentially there's an audience on a sports network, and I've typically bought an entertainment network, I want to be able to have that fluidity of inventory. Um, so I think that that's a key driver. And then the ability to use data um, to inform all the buys they're making. I would say data and automation um, um, are, are really key. And some of the larger advertisers uh, in the U.S. have definitely brought a lot of that capability in-house. So um, on the publisher side, we have to service the needs of all types of clients. Um, so we've actually set up the structure in the U.S. to have an agency focus and a category focus, a client direct focus, I should say, um, so that we can make sure that we're, um, you know, reaching and servicing our clients in whichever manner that they, they want. Um, how, how, quickly to is that, how quickly is that advanced, Laura, the, the, the client and agency, the, both the direct uh, parts of the business that you need to develop? Has that been the last 12 months? Uh, and, and where does it look? Where's it going to head in the next in the next year, I guess? 
I mean, th we are um, really focused um, and really committed to sort of this category, uh, this client direct sell, um, as well as making sure we support the agencies. And I think that's only a result of you're starting to see more of an increase um, in that um, moving towards bringing some of those capabilities in house, particularly when you start to look at things like programmatic and automated buying and, and how you partner um, with folks like the, the trade desk. So, but there's the, we still have to be flexible enough that we can service our clients in both ways. But if we weren't seeing an increase, we wouldn't be structured in, in the way that we are today. And, and those client teams, uh, interestingly, are they as sophisticated as the agencies in wanting and, and executing on the cross-screen uh, sort of uh, planning and buying that, that you're, you're moving towards? Are they, are they do, they're leaving some of it to their agency partners or are they doing it all in-house? What's happening with the, with the big end there on that? I, I, honestly, I think it varies. I think the, the one thing that um, you know everybody is looking for is how do you maximize your the purchases that you're making across all platforms and the agencies are setting up teams and services to service their clients in that manner and then there are some clients that just want to take those that that capability in-house and find partners um, whether it be you know an ad tech partner along with a publisher to create those connections and and you know I would say we're, we're doing both right how do we how do you work with a holding company to help extend an, an optimization or targeting pl a plan that they're building or how how do you work with a client directly and uh, figure out ways to, ma to match audiences and activate those in you know um, uh, privacy safe and, and data safe environments so I, we're, we're, we're really focused in both areas. We might come back to that in a, in, in a second about some of, some of the, uh, the tactics or the, the, the structures and, and capabilities you're building there. But Tim Sims, do you, what do you see in that, that um, in how agencies and, and clients are responding to this, this convergence that's going on and, and the change in, in, in audience consumption of television? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at it from a from a marketer perspective and an agency perspective, um, I, I think this shift has created an enormous opportunity. Um, and, and I'll come back around to some of the stuff that Laura was saying. But like, if you, if you think about this from a, from a brand's perspective, they are spending an enormous amount of time and effort and money trying to understand their audience in, in a much deeper way now. Um, they're often hiring data scientists. They're licensing data management platforms and, and other ways that they can really understand their audience. And now for one of the first times in the history of marketing, they can take all that hard work and they can point it at the television screen. And that has created just an enormous opportunity for marketers. And in, in concert with what Laura was saying, is what they want to do is they want to be able to have that conversation with the consumer across different screens or across a portfolio of brands like with someone uh, like Disney, where they can have that conversation and utilize that audience and point it at Hulu and point it at uh, ESPN and across the entire portfolio. And that conversation, I think, is what's happening more and more um, in the US, is how brands can partner with someone like Disney to deliver their audience using technology across all of these different screens and across a full portfolio. And then if you zoom out to the, to the macro ecosystem, that same thing is true. And so, you know, one of the things that, that programmatic, I think, does really well is it creates this normalization layer on top of fragmentation, because I think what's happened over the last couple of years in the, at least the U.S. market, I think the same is true as on, in Australia, is that you've got uh, kind of two parallel forces that are happening. You've got content consolidation in that you've got, you know, Disney and Hulu coming together. You've got Viacom CBS and, and Pluto. You've got Fox and Tubi and all a lot of this, this kind of consolidation that's happening um, uh, in the U.S. market. But at the same time, you also have distribution fragmentation. And so there's content available in so many different places. And one of the things that Programmatic does really well is it normalizes that fragmentation so that, back to what I was saying earlier, you can take that audience and point it at all of this in a normalized way and say, hey, here's how I can address my audience and manage frequency holistically and buy cross portfolio from partners like Disney. It really enables uh, just an amazing opportunity for, um, uh, for brands and marketers. And that's largely, and in most cases, being executed uh, by the agency um, uh, using you know a platform like the Trade Desk, and so I, I think it's just created, uh, just unlocked so much potential from a brand and marketing perspective and a storytelling perspective from an advertising uh, angle. Patrick, the Australian perspective, how how is how is your group um, reshaping and for, for this 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 cross screen uh, convergence shift? What how do you see it? Uh, what's happening right now for you? A, a lot. Um, I think Laura's point around flexibility is just so critical. And I will, I'll come back to it because there's a step that we had to go through 
beforehand, really, I think. And it's a, it's a mindset shift. Um, even on this panel, you know, for, for our customers that are out there, we, we throw around lots of acronyms and we talk about them as, as almost different things. That doesn't help uh, our customers. Um, if we think about consumption, uh, it, as, a, as a human, it's great content. We don't really think about the device we watch it on. It's just TV. So internally, we're going through a process around it's all just TV. And, and that, that, um, that's really, really important because to start to think about how you then organize yourself around that. Um, and so I think, you know, as I said, it's, it's very much a, a mindset shift um, and getting closer to how the consumer actually thinks about this, right? And as I said, they follow great content. I think the flexibility piece that Laura mentioned is just so important. Um, and, you know, that permeates in, into a, a lot of things. Um, but I think from a trading perspective, um, going into, say, next year for us in, in terms of negotiations with these guys, that's going to be a really, really core theme. How do we break down some of the sort of barriers and silos of the way that we've um, done this before and allow investment to move a lot more fluidly um, across, you know, TV, right? It's all just TV. Um, such that we can follow consumption and behavior um, better, I think. And so that flexibility in the way that, that we work with media owners is absolutely, um, absolutely critical. I don't think we've seen certainly a, um, in some areas, some clients, they will start to take on more digital or programmatic th themselves um, in-house. I think and for, for, for many clients, that's a really important step and, and we're supportive of that. Not all, you know, it, it's obviously by, by client. I think that, that we've got to be cautious though. Um, and I think as an industry, you know, on-demand viewing, because it was on the internet, grew up in the digital way of thinking. And, and I don't think that's right. Um, and so I think that we've just got to be cautious if clients are running stuff themselves internally, that we don't create an, a new silo that has on-demand viewing over here because it can be run programmatically or digital digitally. And then linear over here in an agency. Um, I think that you know creates a, a new degree of separation that I think co the convergence is is trying to, to solve for. Um, and so I think this that that mindset is mindset is so important in the sense that um, I think what that actually does as an industry, but certainly for us as an agency, we've got to get the you know viewing great content on the big screen back into TV thinking, um, planning and buying, and it, it really it should just be what one thing together in, in my opinion. Well, Laura, can I ask you on that? Because that's that's a that's a big call to say let's bring digital and, prog and pro programmatically delivered uh, television back into, into traditional linear thinking or linear operating. Does that, how, does that are you happy with that? Yeah, I mean, we we look at all of our inventory, you know, as one pool, and we we encourage our our uh, our clients to um, not think of them so separately. Particularly when you talk about sort of what we deem is our video is one of the you know few in, in the US that is premium, right? So we, we want people to think about how to buy across it. We need to make sure we have better tech so we can do all the things that Tim said, like manage reach and frequency and, and make sure that we can provide people flexibility. Mm -hmm. I think we're, um, and, and you know, if you had said three or four years ago that we're gonna put our all of our long form video content into a programmatic marketplace, people would have said no way because it's gonna commoditize it and drive it down, right? So what, we, what we're realizing now is that there is a way to protect long form video to make sure that it gets the value it can get, add data and automation to it. Um, but we also have a lot of different distribution points and they all don't allow or enable us from a technical standpoint to make everything available programmatically as well either. So there's, you know, there, there's the philosophy of it and then there's um, how do we actually put it in, into place. And then there's just, there's still, there, there's still an inherent, um, um, the premium or, or, or the TV, whether we're buying it linearly or, or, or um, on digital, there is a capacity, there is, there is a constraint against that. So agencies still wanna make sure that they get the, they secure their inventory at the rate that they wanna secure it at, but they wanna make sure that there's some automation and data to that. And and those have been, you know, that that's sometimes the, the challenge is to make sure that we can, we can deliver on those, right? And if you're trying to do that in a biddable environment, how do you know that you're actually going to reach the commitment that you've you know negotiated rates for in that situation if that makes sense so there's just it's it's even sort of how we engage in terms of the negotiations to make sure that the technology can do what it, it can do and have right business terms in place if that makes sense yeah i want to get tim and michael's uh, uh perspective on this but, but patrick just to be clear when you talk about the concern or the danger the warning you're signaling about television getting into a digital and becoming silo again just clarify a little bit what, what that that concern is for you 
uh, it was more related to, I guess, the, yeah. the, the point around clients starting to sort of in-house more, more of their, their digital, right. just not yeah. allowing that to, to separate an agency running what we call linear and, and you know, a client yeah. running what we call BVOD. They're the, they're the same thing, especially now it's all consumed on, on TV. But I think um, yeah, there's a lot of debate as, you know, does old school TV bend to digital or digital bend to TV? I don't even think that's the right question. Um, consumption's changing so fast into a new world we should be thinking about what is the new way to do this stuff, not which bends to, to either direction. Um, and what does that look like? So, I mean, if it's not one or the other, is it some hybrid that you're, you're about to invent for us? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Here on the spot, I've got I'm a, an announcement today. No, I, I wish I had that silver bullet. I don't. But I do think that it's a move away from proxy media metrics, right? I don't know, share in, in, a, in, a, in a trading agreement or just reach or impressions to actual business outcomes. Um, I think, you know, the, the whole point of trying to get the mix of investment right across these different screens is to support a client selling more of their products or building more loyal customers. And I think we've got to get to more of a place, you know, um, fo focused on that. And I think, you know, to Laura's point, and, and agencies have a huge role in this. Um, I think if, if going in, well, whatever your next year looks like, and ours is, ours is a calendar year, but um, going into next year, if the way that we approach, uh, you know, trading on behalf of our clients and setting up those frameworks, if they don't look significantly different to years past, then we haven't done a good enough job. Kim Sims, your take on that? No, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with just the, the role that need, needs to be played there. And, and the way that I, I've kind of thought about this too is it's very, very aligned. It's like what, what, at least from a technology perspective, we're really focused on is just creating bridges between these two worlds because we're going to live with kind of one foot in, one foot out of both of these worlds for the foreseeable future, right? Like we're in this massive sh shift change that's happening across the entire media landscape everywhere in the world once in a generation, you know, whatever we want to call it. But we still have to live with one foot in both worlds. And so it's just about how we bridge those. But as you said, it's all TV, right? And so from a consumer perspective, from a brand perspective, it's all just TV. And so how we create those bridges, which is through things like consistent measurement, it's through things like consistent attribution and, and what we're after um, uh, ultimately from a, from a brand perspective and how we do that cross screen and cross portfolio, all of these things, that's the, the, the kind of devil in the details, but it's really just about bridging these two worlds, not separating them. So Laura and uh, so Michael uh, Stevenson, Laura and, and Patrick have talked about flexibility. Um, and I guess the question is, how flexible are you? I think you've got a bad back at the moment, so there may be no appropriate question. But um, there's also a question that's come through in the feed as well, which is, Michael, with audience fragmenting across screens, are brands and agencies, agencies asking you to sell more holistically across screens? And how are you responding to that? So um, flexibility and give us your where, where is nine at? So first question first, um, there's 100% flexibility at Nine, whether advertising revenue comes into our linear business, live streaming, or our on-demand platform is irrelevant, irrelevant to us. At the end of the day, we're just here to facilitate the ability for a brand or for an agency to reach their target audience in the most effective and most efficient way possible, wherever that audience happens to be consuming our content. So there are no barriers um, and we have 100% flexibility. In terms of our agencies asking us to, or brands asking us to um, sell holistically across screens, I 100% I, I, I believe that television at some point will be completely delivered through the internet. That is at some point in the future. And what we've got to manage, or what we are managing today is that transition from you know, live linear to fully internet delivered TV. And it's that transition I think that will be really interesting at an industry here, at an industry level here in Australia, we've, we've been working on a thing called Virtual Oz for the last couple of years, and in early December that will launch, and that will do two things that are really, really important. The first is it'll um, allow you to plan and buy total television and measure the incremental reach that BVOD or video on demand um, adds to, to linear TV. So the first time um, that anyone will be able to do that from a, a gold standard uh, measurement service like Oztam and Nielsen here in Australia. The second thing, of course, that it does is um, we'll measure co-viewing um, through on-demand platforms, which is what we haven't been able to do to this point. So I think they're two really, really important changes. At a, at a sort of a, at a company level, what we realised five years ago was that our view was over time um, that buyers would want to buy television and video on-demand 
all from the same person using one piece of technology to maximize the the reach and frequency of their campaign and so we went into the world into the globe to look for a piece of tech that we could go and buy off the shelf of course that didn't exist um so we came back to australia and we built it ourselves and that thing is called nine galaxy it allows you to fully automate the buying and selling of television across linear tv and bvod what is really interesting about that is that almost nobody is using it yes right. so 50% of our inventory um that can be traded through galaxy is now being traded in a fully automated world so that is someone buys an audience at a price that's delivered not one rating point more not one rating point less delivered within the time frame um and like i said 50% of all of our inventory that can be traded through the platform is now being traded in that way which is amazing but also seriously scary at the same time because that means the other 50% isn't and so people are going in and buying traditional old linear tv spots in a market in an off peak time slot for a very low cost optimizing moving cancelling rebooking wasting time pretty much so that that's the first thing i find a bit strange the i've second- got to ask god have you come back to i've got to ask patrick though because it's a great point um uh, michael that you know, nobody's uh using it when half the half the market is not using what should be an efficient um tool so patrick agencies uh, are agencies um rhetorically progressive and behaviorally uh challenged i guess is is the way to put it <laughs> Yep, I got to be honest and say yes, right? Um I've worked in a, a few of the big ones. Um I think that we I don't think there was as much rhetoric and behavior hadn't changed. I think there is more now. Um I'm sitting here, right? Um I, I do think and as I said before around mindset, I do think that one of the um most important things to change first is our behavior around this. And I think agencies play a massive role uh in it. Um I I, I tend to agree, you know, with, with Michael we've we've even been slow um to deliver on the 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 sort of promise. I I can only speak from the perspective of 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 Dentsu. Um we are going through rapid transformation to live what I'm sitting here talking about um and going into to next year uh, we we won't be doing anything the same as as years prior so you know it, it's still words me, me sitting here but um we are absolutely and and have gone uh, on a long journey to make it actual systemic behavioral change um because we have fallen behind the way people consume tv Or is that the what what is what is the the scenario that we're talking about here in Australia is that um is that sort of the the talk and the and the and the call for action versus the actual ability to act on it uh, are we are we a little bit strange down under is it the, is it the same in the US I mean you are strange in some uh, ways but maybe not on that one <laughs> very funny uh, i would say it's very similar right i i think and to the point i made earlier a lot of this is sort of there's the measurement piece there's the technology piece and and those you know aren't easily solvable but you know particularly in technology space you're, there's a lot of progress but when you start to actually sit down and talk about terms and how you're engaging in a negotiation and and what are uh you know how do you actually um commit to certain dollars and how to how do you manage those dollars that they move across platforms and what does that mean to the overall delivery and or the CPM that's where sometimes it things get that get caught up so i i you know we've i've had a lot of great conversations with holding companies and and um our advertisers and then you start to get into sort of the weeds of it and it becomes i think more about the terms than it does uh, about the mechanics and then there's also there's cost implications to it too so you know how how are you managing changing um potentially um increase of cost in the short term but uh, improved our ROI in the long term and that's that I think a, a hurdle that I would think on particularly in the agency side it, it is is tough to reconcile and and we we have some struggles with it too so I would say we're probably pretty aligned here There's a few a few questions coming in I want to see some more of this particularly around these these hot spots but Tim Sims your 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 take on what we've been talking about now between the the behavior the and 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 uh the rhetoric capability yeah, to do it yeah I mean I think I think 
it's never been more possible to uh, uh, activate the, in the way in an automated way against television than it than it is today. And so, if you look about uh, look at just the difference between maybe like you know four or five years ago, especially in the connected television world here in the United States, relative to where we are today, it's dramatically different. I mean, I, I remember having some of our very first conversations with Hulu five years ago about programmatic, and you know, the conversation was kind of like. Wow, sounds sounds neat what you guys are doing over there in programmatic. <laughs> let me let me know how it goes. <laughs> and, uh, and then if you fast forward to today, we have just an incredible partnership with Disney and and everyone. And and as as you think about just that shift change in the marketplace in a relatively short period of time uh, compared to the history of television, I think that change has has just been incredible. And it's never been more possible to activate audience, manage holistic frequency, do all of these things from a technology standpoint, but we, we still have you know some ways to go. Uh, you know, as we pointed out, we, we've got, we're in the middle of this transition, but every single quarter, every single year, we're getting better and better at delivering on that promise. I think, can I, can I just add yeah. to that? Let's, and I completely agree, Tim, that, you know, what has happened over the course of the last few years, call it five years, relative to the history of television, it has been lightning speed. But relative to the pace of change, it's actually quite slow. Mm -hmm. And my point is that, like, all of these things that we're talking about, they're kind of all happening and they can happen today. I think we need to move a lot quicker than we all are um, because it does, you know, we can build the technology, we can change the business models, we can do all of that, but we can only move as quick as the slowest mover. And whether the slowest mo whoever the slowest mover is, and in a different market, in a different, in different uh, parts of the, of the world, it might be different, but... You know, we need to all move together and do it a lot quicker than we're currently doing it. So on, on that, though, Michael... Count, count the trade desk in to go, go, go fast. <laughs> count, I was like, count us in to go as fast as you want to go. <laughs> so, listen, yeah. the, the, the thing on that, though, Michael, is that when you talk about only the market can only move as, it's, as, as, as quickly as its slowest mover, let's take television, for instance. We, we, you know, I know there's some initiatives coming through, but television's talked for quite a while about doing some things that are supposed to fast track. And if you think about a, a single trading model, is the, the, the whole point, I'd like to get Patrick's um, take on the use of his use of Galaxy, for instance, but is it, is it because there's too many um, uh, platforms or trading in, uh, interfaces for them to juggle between, I've got to do something for nine, 10, seven, SBS, whatever it might be. D does something central need to happen or is it, can, can the market sustain multiple, uh, you know, ways in to trade multiple different uh, broadcast partners and therefore screen and platforms yeah I, I i mean i don't see there's there's a, an absolute need to have one platform to buy all of television um there isn't one platform to buy all of search or one platform to buy all of social etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but should we make it easier of course we should do it was back to my earlier point um you know the platform that we've built allows you to buy linear and bevo together but that's not the way the market has chosen to operate as much as we say that these things have converged the way in which the market is buying them are completely different TV buyers buy TV and digital buyers, to Pat's point, are buying video on demand. And so the requirement to have one platform on the, on the buy side, which is kind of where we were headed in Australia, is maybe less important today than maybe we thought it was 12 months ago. So in this country, we still will, and our industry is aligned to creating a platform to make buying TV easier, but it won't look like we thought it would 12 months ago because that's not the way the market wants us to provide a platform to do that and they've made a decision to do it differently patrick your your, your, your sense on that yep um so i think that there's three core components to sort of our strategy around this and and they're intentionally in an order and and the first is as i've said around mindset language behavior um you know how we um start to completely reframe what you know, TV is to us. And, and as I said before, then we organize around that. So that has to mean that uh, a client team doesn't have linear TV bought here and BVOD in a programmatic team on a different floor, right? That, that doesn't support what we're talking about. So organizationally, we're, we're now designing around that, that idea of it's just TV. I think the second part um, has to be uh, a real turning 
the way we, we work with the media owners on its head, right? So that that, that idea of, of, of flexibility. Um, and that is that is hard. Like, and, and, and I say it from all parts of the industry. And Michael and I were talking about this this morning. You've still got um, analysts who obsess about share in linear in how they talk about which network is is winning over who in the market. They're not even factoring in so much of this conversation. So while those things are still true, it, it's going to be hard. But, you know, I think that that flexibility point is such an important one. And, and those two things for me have to really come before technology can play the role we want it to. And it's probably why Galaxy sits there un underutilized because um, we, we probably, in industry-wide, I don't think we've got the first two bits. Are right you yet. underutilizing Galaxy, Pat? Uh, I, I honestly, I don't know how much we, we're using it or not using it. Right. Okay. Um, but I can say that we uh, are well progressed on a journey around the first two components of of that that strategy, right? To to enable more use of of technology and trading. Laura, Laura. So can I ask? You know that that demarcation between linear and broadcast and digital and and, and the capabilities. How are you? How are you dealing with that at, at Disney uh, in in the advertising group? What 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 happens? Is it, are you in, trying to bring it together or is the skill sets yeah. still too far apart? No, I, I, we, um, as we brought together over the last three or three or, uh, plus years, we brought together sellers that sold across multiple brands, but we're also making sure that they sell across, um, be able to have the ability to sell across platforms. We do, do still, and we'll have some specialists in digital, particularly when you think about programmatic, it's a, a little bit of, uh, of a unique skill to some of the, the buyers that have so, um, to some of the sellers uh, um, that we have in place. But ultimately it's, you're coming in one door to buy our, our, our linear, our digital, our, you know, um, our, we have social, um, you know, we have short form and you're coming in one place to buy it and you should be served that way and they should be able to speak to all of that. Um, I, I think um, to some of the earlier points, not every agency is set up that way, but we, uh, the way we interface with each holding company is as one selling team and we don't fragment out how, how we sell different types of content, whether it's by brand or by uh, uh, inventory type. Tim, your, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I'll just comment on our experience working with with Laura and the Disney team. It's been fantastic because you know what you know, and, and we were you know had a similar thing where we would go in and have an ESPN, and I'll just use Disney as the example. We'd go have an ESPN conversation one day, an ABC conversation the next day, and and, and maybe a, a Hulu conversation you know a week later. And what's been awesome over the last couple of years is just to consolidate that conversation where we we just even as a technology partner to, to brands and agencies and our partnership with Disney to go in and talk about how we advance the market forward to have that holistic conversation with a partner like Disney across all of their brands and all of the entire content portfolio has been fantastic. And so I can speak as a partner of, of Disney's that that has just been a wonderful uh, uh, just uh, advancement, I think. And it's been just, I think it's been fantastic for how we've, you know, helped pull things forward um, Laura, in the Laura, market in the U.S. Laura, Michael mentioned, you know, scouring the world for some technology to do some things. What is your what is your ad technology stack looking like? I know it's a, you're in an, we talked about this earlier. Uh, you've got an interesting position in that you've got Hulu proprietary technology and you've got uh, that's on the Hulu side. Disney's working with Google. You've got to make a call and whenever that is um, to, to decide how that lands. You're not certainly going to tell me or us what that's going to look like. But what's the time frame for you to to land on a, on a technology stack? And what is that new stack have to look like? I mean, I think without question, we, um, you know, we need to unify our linear stack. We have recently, you know, with Google prior to the uh, Hulu acquisition, unified our digital stack uh, through Google. But those are the evaluations and the plans. I mean, we have a plan for, you know, to quickly over the course of the next 12 to 24 months, start to continue to unify that stack. Uh, and and the, the partners, um, the partnerships that we create. So it's a huge initiative, I think, for us to be able to better serve, uh, you know, the, the promise of the sales team of this unified uh, conversation across platforms, across brands, in different types of uh, transaction types has to be supported by one unified ad stack. Um, and, you know, in, in a company as large as ours, that could be complicated, but we have a dedicated ad platforms teams that sole focus is making sure that we bring those together as, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge initiative for us. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, w with our competitors in the marketplace, we've all gone through that as we've consolidated over the last few years at different, at different stages. And I think the ability for us all to, to 
you know, be more lined up will allow the way agencies transact with us um, to become a little bit more unified because it's hard to have conversations with different uh, partners that are at different points of, of that um, unification. Um, and I think, I think to an early point, it's less about potentially the partners you work, you work for. It's about the capabilities that exist within each of those stacks and how you then can uh, engage um, uh, with advertisers in terms of, of how you can provide that flexibility um, um, as part of their upfront or whether it's in, in scatter. Um, and that scenario is what, some, sometime next year, you think that'll happen, you'll make a call on that or Disney will make a call on that, Laura? Is that what's the timing? Yeah, it's more about the implementation timing is, is uh, to be sort of fully aligned, I think is more in like the 12 to 18 months. But, okay. um, you know, there, those conversations are ongoing um, okay. today. Tim, Tim, uh, Germany's an interesting example, right, in terms of what the broadcasters have done there in terms of their ad stack. Talk, talk us very quickly through that because we've got to try and get to, you know, premium content in short form and, and that, and we're, I'm, I'm running out of time. If, if, if uh, Sydney could throw up how much time I've got left, I've lost track. But um, uh, give us, tell us Germany, uh, would you, Tim? Yeah, you know, Germany's an interesting market. I mean, it, it's not dissimilar from what's happening in other markets, I, th I think. But if you look at the two major broadcasters in Germany with RTL and ProSieben, they, they have uh, owned and operated um, technology stacks. And so they both own um, SSPs. They, ha they have an ad tech kind of verticalized strategy where, where they have that tech in-house. And what, what that's made, at least from our partnership with, with both of those guys, with RTL and ProSieben, is it's made it very seamless for us to execute campaigns across that because the, the technology is already kind of baked into the offering. Um, but a lot of what Laura's describing is, is the same thing, you know, with a, with a partner like Disney too, where you can buy across all of this. And so I think what's unique about Germany is they've kind of verticalized that and acquired um, or, or kind of have homegrown SSP uh, uh, tech, which is not dissimilar from, from what Hulu has, as Laura pointed out. Um, so, th and that's the, so how do you see that? That's Germany, Germany an outlier, Tim, is that kind of gonna be unusual? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think what we'll see uh, over time, I, th I think what is interesting about, you know, major media companies around the world is that they uh, all, always have choices to make around, you know, technology investment, technology partnerships and all, all of these things. And so I think it, it works really well in Germany, but, um, you know, I think it, it, it's probably determined by each market and what the needs are in that market. Um, it, it works really well there, but I think everybody has choices to make around how they partner with technology or, or build things in house. Um, so I, I think time will tell uh, whether, uh, big media companies decide to kind of build or, or, or partner over time. Michael Stevenson, tech stack for you, looking, f uh, you know, now and next, what, what's your sense on partnerships and how it's going to look for, for Nine and perhaps the, the television market here in, in Australia? Yeah, so we had a philosophy that was buy what you can and build what you can't. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of where we ended up with with sort of our, the, the linear technology that, that we've built. And again, you know, our philosophy is partner with the best in breed to deliver to deliver on the outcomes that we need to deliver to clients based on whatever that transactional type happens happens to be. Um, we're working really closely in, as an industry in Australia to build a platform for the industry um, to, make, to buy, be, make buying linear television even easier. Um, and I think there's still work to be done in terms of how we evolve sort of the BVOD uh, market over time. Pat, what would you like to see? It's got to consolidate. Um, I don't think it needs to be down to one. Um, but it definitely does, you know, need to consolidate. Very similarly, we look at things, you know, who can we partner with? We partner with the trade desk um, and partner with fewer, better um, technology platforms. When it comes to convergence, um, you know, w w we're building um, because we didn't see anyone out there that's truly doing um, convergence TV, specifically around planning, buying, reporting. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think it needs to be fewer. Um, and I think from our perspective, we're investing in, in building in areas that doesn't exist today so that we can kind of carry the industry forward a, t a tiny bit. There's one, one quick question I want to ask Michael from, from, from the audience, which is how do, how do we as an industry merge the skills of, of linear TV and programmatic? So what, how do, what's Nine's take on this? What do you, how do you see this playing out, Michael? I mean, we, so we've created a, a sales academy, if you like, at Nine to increase the capability of all of our, all of our teams. Like Laura, we have a... a a business that's broad in terms of asset and we have a fully integrated team so um, all of our team should be able to talk quite openly about all of our products and in most cases be a single point of contact to a to an advertiser or a partner um, programmatic is still quite specific and we do have like the guys at disney um, a specific programmatic programmatic team um, 
But as the world moves more towards its digital future, uh, the capability of those teams will need to continue to increase. Let's move to, um, thank you, Michael. Let's move to premium television, premium content versus uh, short form and user generated uh, and the walled gardens, which is obviously um, a, hot, a, hot, a perpetual hotspot for all of us and, and, and how we value uh, content, how, we, how much we were prepared to pay for that versus, you know, sort of short form. Patrick, you've got a, a pretty interesting perspective on this in that you have some concerns about if we don't get the pricing regimes or uh, understand the differences, <clears throat> that it could, there's, there's some, some big issues ahead. Yeah. Um, well, did you know, I just make that up for you? No, no. no. Um, I like the question, just, though. Yeah, I'll get up from under that bus. No, yeah. um, no. I think, I think there's, there's a bit to it. I think we've got to be cautious of, of you know, tagging anything premium. Um, it's in the eye of the, the, the person watching, and I think what, what the obsession of binging great TV and telling stories about it at dinner parties tells us is is we love that at the moment. Um, but I think the point is that they are very different. So um, if I think about, you know, you, user-generated content, um, YouTube, Facebook, like those kind of platforms, really, really important in our media mix as an agency, but very, very different in terms of the experience um, for, the, for the human being versus, you know, sitting there watching, you know, long, like series after series of Grey's Anatomy, right? It, we have to acknowledge there's, uh, there is a difference and that will mean that there's a, a kind of different application um, to the, the strategy of a campaign, different impact on, on results. Um, and I made the point before that uh, while understandably in its emergence, things like BVOD sort of grew up under the, the, the digital way of thinking and digital measurement, I think we've, we've got to change that and, and fast. And what I mean by that is I think when you take, you know, long form broadcast quality content um, and it sits alongside uh, short form user generated content on a media plan and then and we apply measurement you know cost frequency reach to all of that as a group um, I, I don't think we're comparing apples for apples uh, because as I said that they're quite different both important but important separately and for me the risk I see in that is we commoditize we, we could end up commoditizing what is the TV experience and that's why I said I'm really reluctant to see things that, that split that out that way um, and so yeah I, I think that you know we, we've got a um, start acknowledging that, that they're different. Um, and for me, I'm a big fan of, of supporting broadcast TV. Um, and I think that, you know, measuring it in, in that way it even risks our ability to in, continue to invest in, in great content because we, we may end up commoditizing it. So it's not, it's not bring that back to TV thinking. It's push it into a new way of, of thinking. Tim Sims, thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. You know, when, I, I agree with with, with uh, almost everything that, that you said. I think one of the most curious paradigms to me that that exists in the media landscape is that you know, especially in digital, um, you know, a lot of the first dollars in are, are today, and this is widely covered in the media. You know, first dollars in are going to Facebook and Google. They keep growing share uh, in in so many ways across uh, overall investment in media. Um, but what's so interesting to me about that is that if you take search out of it and look at it through YouTube and, and, and Facebook, is that you know, one, one of the downsides of that is that you have this UGC environment. You also have kind of a one-way street as it relates as it relates to data. And so the paradigm, I think, and CTV will be the catalyst for this, will likely flip over the next couple of years, where the place to start on the media plan is this notion of like, hey, where can I use my data? Where can I manage that frequency? Where can I get inputs back so that I can reinform what I'm doing? And so I agree with what you said, where it's like it actually, I think, will shift. Facebook, YouTube, all, all of those UGC platforms have a, have a place in, in the media plan. I just question whether they're the first stop in the media plan because you have the greatest content ever produced in the history of the world coming from two of our panelists today. And wow, when you can apply data there and get data back to understand the, the performance and, and, the, and what's happening, wow, that sounds like a great place to start um, and then go to some of the UGC platforms second. And so I'd love to see that paradigm flip over the next several years. Well, I'm sure that's music to both uh, Laura and Michael Stevenson's ears. Laura, your, your, your take on that, though, do, do, you, do you, again, do we have a disconnect in the market, though, that we, we have two panellists here saying all the right things from, from your guys' perspective? Uh, market behaviour and perception, is it, is it shifting yet? Premium versus, you know, uh, long to, like short form? Um, I, I think at, at Disney we look at it a couple ways. One of which is um, the ad experience, right? We, we can't have 30-second uh, commercials running in front of 30-second pieces of content. So just making sure that we're being mindful of, of that ad experience is, is really important. We think our content, regardless of, of the 
the length and the platform on which it's on, which is inclusive of YouTube and Facebook, particularly when you get into things like branded content, is premium and, and should come with you know uh, the the premium that we think uh, it, it deserves. And I and I don't I, I agree that um, it is in the eye of the beholder in terms of a UGC versus um, you know something that we produce. But I, I just think there are, there are just inherently different values in that. But we also think about Facebook and. Twitter and, and YouTube as support as a part of a media plan that you can buy from us that that helps to reach that audience in many different ways. So we're not, you know, sort of, you know, separating those. And in some ways we play in the wall gardens and but we do it with our content, which we think has a certain amount of value. But we have to be mindful of the experience we're giving that viewer when they're watching it and, and making sure that we're not, um, you know, giving them a poor experience. Michael Stevens, you were nodding your head when Tim was talking about, you know, starting with the data first uh, for for linear or for, for for broadcast or for digital television. Bvod, um, you, you, you're clearly uh, in agreement there, you, probably because you've got a plan, have you? Yeah, well, so we we had our upfronts here in Australia uh, just on two weeks ago, where we announced a a partnership with Adobe um, for exactly that reason. Because I think right now what happens is, you know, as as a campaign goes through an agency. Through the planning stage, there is at some point uh, a, a percentage of the budget is allocated to TV, some is allocated to video on demand, and then you have search and social, etc. So we're never seen as an alternative to uh, Facebook or or YouTube. Um, they're, they're both for very different reasons, and, and I'm not suggesting for one second that they shouldn't be because there are specific roles for them. However, I do want to, and the reason I was nodding my head is Tim said an alternative. What I wanted to do was offer advertisers an alternative if they were allocating funds to YouTube or to Facebook. Now, how do you do that? It needs to be a data-driven decision. So what we did, we've done a deal with Adobe um, and created a product called Audience Match powered by Adobe, which will have Nine's data in the Adobe platform right alongside Facebook and Google's. So when an advertiser is uploading their segments and their data and searching for those audiences, whereas today their choice is Facebook or Google, in a month or six weeks time, it'll be Facebook, Google or Nine. And I think that's a really, I think that's a really interesting um, announcement and development because back to your point, Tim, it gives people a premium alternative to the, uh, to the options that they've had historically. Um, and I think ultimately that, um, that will deliver uh, better results for advertisers. We've proven that TV and BVOD in combination is more powerful than anything else. And we've proven through the work we've done here in Australia with Professor Karen Nelson Field that uh, the bigger the screen and the longer you see the ad, more effective it is. Go figure. Um, so I think <laughs> this partnership with Adobe can really do pretty amazing things for brands. Well, it's certainly going to pitch the efficacy or the effectiveness of some of your content and your platform. I think there's 13 million users you've got your upload into the Adobe yep. Audience Manager or whatever it is. Um, it's going to, you, you're going to be able to check the people are going to the market's going to be able to test the effectiveness of both, aren't they? That's the that's going to be an interesting one, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, back to my earlier point, there are roles for both, and I'm not naive to think that that's not the case. But I do think that um, there will be better results, better business results, real business outcomes delivered when you deliver it in a premium, more engaged environment. Tim and Laura, um, Adobe did come out with this announcement and say it's, they, they think it's the first they've done like this with a media company with uh, premium content uh, or broadcast content uh, in the world. Are you aware of anything like this? And what do you make of that initiative? Does that something for, for Laura, for Disney, does that say, um, yeah, we, we, we are going to play there, you're going to do that? Or is that something that's sort of to the side and not, not uh, of primary focus? Um, I would say, like, we're really focused right now uh, on building our own proprietary ID graph that we can utilize um, and work with clients um, to activate their campaigns against. I think it's interesting concept to understand sort of how, at, you know, on the agency side, they're able to look at those audiences and and and, and do a, a comparison across platforms. So, let's say we haven't gotten there yet. I think it's an interesting concept. There's just obviously a lot of, you know, concerns in terms of what is the type of um, you know, information that, that we're sharing. But I, I think the, any time that you can create a, a tool that an agency is using to make smarter decisions about their buy, it's, imp it's important. We just have to make sure we understand sort of what, what the give and take is in terms of 
um, you know, uh, of how that information is utilised, if that makes sense. Sure. And Tim, I guess you have the equivalent to what, what Michael's talking about. I mean, what's your, your thinking on this and, and the alternative to that Michael's talking about uh, to the wall gardens? Yeah, I mean, I think you know we talk a lot at, at, at TTD about this just this concept of the open internet, and and I, I think one of the incredible benefits of this open ecosystem is that it provides comparability of media type. You can say, how did my CTV campaign perform next to my audio campaign, next to my display campaign, next to my online video campaign, and being able to have that comparability from a brand and marketer perspective is so valuable so that they can understand how to continue to invest and reinvest over time. And that thing I think is exactly what, what we're describing here is trying to create contrast across all these different media um, types so that we can understand what's working, what's delivering ROI for, for brands and marketers so that they can continue to reinvest. Um, and I, I think that ultimately is the, is the holy grail for a lot of marketers. How can I see that in as few places as possible um, and make sure that I'm investing in the right place, in the right areas with my... Uh, yeah, got my it. So listen, we've got, a, we've got a few minutes left and we're going to wrap up, but there's a question here for Michael. So that given that we're just on this subject and we're going to try and touch on measurement and then uh, wrap up. But uh, the question for Michael is there has been a lot of talk uh, about what constitutes premium video versus social video. You talk about alternatives to social and, and your partnership with Adobe helping drive that. Can Nine take on the challenge to take challenge, challenge Facebook and Google on their own or does Nine need to do it together with the rest of the market? Um, is that so, a set up or what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I, I, you know, do, do we have a, a competitive advantage today in this market? Possibly. We have 13 million signed in users. And to give context to those not from Australia, um, there are 24 million people in Australia. So we've got a fairly significant signed in user base delivering, um, with, delivering a first party data um, opportunity for brands. So can we today compete? I think we can head in that direction. Ultimately, do you consolidate? I think more consolidation into the future is definitely a theme. Uh, Patrick, your, your call on that, can, does the market need to, can, can, can the, 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 the media companies do it on their own or does it need to be a collective of television in all its forms well, versus Google, Facebook? I, I don't think we should be thinking about competition between various parts of, of our industry in the, in the first place, um, you know, be that broadcast or Facebook or Google. I mean, ultimately that loses sight of, what's most important and our customers and their customers. Um, Cause if, if we, if we focused on business outcomes, how do we make the, the right choice in where we put clients money to, to, to deliver on those business outcomes, the whole pie will grow. We'll make marketing more effective and, and we'll grow the whole pie um, for all of us. Um, but look, I think that when, you know, specifically to the question, there's a huge amount of value to be gained through collaboration. Um, I don't think it necessarily needs to fuel competition, um, but I think we can, and Michael made a really good point. We, we've moved too slow and we, we, we arguably are still moving too slow. I think collaboration plays a really important role to start to move at the speed that we need to, to catch up to consumption. Okay, final one. Tim Sim, start with you. Measurement. Uh, where the hell is that headed in five? What does it look like in five years' time? Where do we start and where does it need to get to in, in, in a few years? It's a big one. It's a big one. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think what uh, you know, I think we need for measurement is that what we something we talked about earlier, which is how do we affect. And I know that there's already advancements, as, as you pointed out earlier in Australia. But I think what we need to do is make sure that measurement is effectively keeping up with the marketplace to create those bridges between those two worlds, because we are going to live in this two these two worlds for a little while as it relates to television. So measurement has to keep up so that we can always be comparing apples and apples. And it comes back to that contrast because when you look at a marketer's ROI, I love the I part of that because the these are media investments. These are investments that they're making in, in, uh, in their brand so that they can communicate with consumers. And so the better we can do to create apples to apples comparison of different media types through measurement, I think the better off brands are going to be, the better off consumers are going to be. And I think it'll create a really thriving ecosystem moving forward. Laura, measurement for you, what is, what, where does it sit? I mean, it is quite a loaded question to end on, I will say that, but you. um, I would, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, we are, uh, we're recently launched a, a product, particularly now that we have Hulu as part of our organization, um, to measure our, uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of our advertising across linear and streaming and the ability to have a product like that in the marketplace so we can share insights with our clients and then ultimately do proof of performance is incredibly important to us. I think one of the big challenges as it relates to ROI or attribution is how is that a shared function between publishers and advertisers and how much of that 
it is still sitting with the advertiser and it's informing what they're buying and 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 how does that work together i'm not sure we figured that out but at the very least we we need to show sort of the value of the universe that sits across all of our our properties and i think the the tool we that we're in the process of launching right now will do that for us yeah, right, and it's a, it's a it's a constant one, right? That that um, on the on the client side, they're not necessarily want to give away too much of their data to actually work right. through effectiveness on. So, what did sales work? Well, we're not going to tell you uh, what our sales data are, right. data is. So that's the that is a that is a, a challenge. But we have to pass back and share information, and for them to to be able to make that analysis, and that becomes a tricky, you know, process sometimes. But yeah, um, so there. What, sorry, was that? I, um, I'm good. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael measurement, uh, um, Pat measurement, and then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, so I think measurement of audiences has always been critical and will continue to be really, really important, and that needs to evolve and become more cross-platform, et cetera, et cetera. Virtual Oz in Australia is helping us to do that. Measurement of effectiveness will become more and more important. And, you know, I think clients over time will have fewer but deeper and much bigger relationships um, with their partners and therefore having shared KPIs and shared goals and being very, really transparent with expectations and outcomes to deliver business growth is the next, uh, the next opportunity. Pat? Yep, I agree with Tim. I think measurement needs to catch up um, to, to convergence. I don't think we should wait for it though or else we'll fur fall further behind um, consumers. I also, th also think we need to really ask ourselves, are we reporting in some circumstances or are we actually measuring? Um, and where we're reporting, stop and actually get to, to me measuring. And I think we've all touched on it, that I love that it's going to move to a place of measuring effectiveness um, to, the, to the clients and customers of ours. It has to. Final question from the audience for you, Laura, which is um, Disney's decision to release Milan directly on Disney Plus. Is this a sign of the future? Will moving super premium content to on demand open up new revenue streams? And how can CTV and BVOD capitalize on this? Do you want me to read that again? No, no, no. I mean, I, look, the um, Mulan experience was, was uh, managed by the Disney Plus team, as you know, is not a uh, an ad supported platform at this time, but it is obviously an experiment that Disney was very interested in doing. And I think everybody is pleased with the performance um, and you'll probably see potentially other, um, you know, uh, events like that, but that's, you know, part of the Disney plus, um, you know, uh, long-term plan. And I'll leave it for those that work on that to talk about the, the success of it and uh, where else it will be extended in the future. That was a great tap dance, Laura. Well done. Um, the Thank you. Tim Sims, the uh, the final crystal ball view from you. The next twelve months, next two years. What do you what do you see really really happening? Crunch and opportunity and challenge. Give us your final uh, uh, crystal ball thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think more acceleration in CTV, data driven advertising will continue to I think lead the way. Um, and if we can solve some of the measurement challenges that we all just described, uh, I think we have a bright future for CTV, for content, for consumers, and for all the parties involved. Well done. Uh, Laura Nelson, Tim Sims, Michael Stevenson, Patrick Darcy, and Paul McIntyre, whoever it is. Thank you for joining us all. And um, <laughs> stay safe. And we will uh, loop back around. I'm sure there's some more stuff coming from the trade desk on, on this big program they're doing. But um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Great, thank you guys.